Hi everyone. So this is our second video for week 11. We're looking at speciation. So, so far we've been looking at populations and how they change, looking at allele frequencies and genotype frequencies, and now we're going to dig into how we get new species. We're going to talk about what that means, what species are, and we're going to think about how scientists define species and speciation. All right, so let me get started. So for our agenda, we're going to define uh, speciation. We're going to figure out what conditions, oh, excuse me, uh, different definitions of what a species is. So it's a less straightforward concept than you would assume. And we're going to look at different mechanisms for how species arise. So our lecture for today is looking at how species arise. I'm going to see some fun pictures of some animals. Um, we're looking at that macro scale. So my goals for you for this lesson, um, I hope by the end you will be able to define speciation, so how we get a new species. Um, and then we're going to look at specifically three definitions or three concepts of what a species is. So we'll dig into biological species, morpho-species concepts, and a phylogenetic species concept. Uh, my goal is also for you to explain and identify different factors of speciation. So these six items are different ways, um, different mechanisms for how new species can arise. So be able to explain what habitat isolation means uh, and then identify it in different examples. Okay, so speciation, what is a species? So if you haven't yet cracked your book this semester, this is the perfect opportunity to dig in um, and see what a helpful resource it is. So before we continue with this lecture, please read uh, pages 480 to 490. So just 10 pages. Um, of all the sections in the book we've talked about so far, I think this one is one of the more straightforward. Lots of uh, helpful and illuminating examples. We're now at that macro level scale, so we're thinking about um, different animal and plant species. Um, so please give that a read. Even if you just skim through, look at the pictures, look at the diagrams, and then come back, I think you'll get a little bit more out of this lecture. So I encourage you to take a break, read those 10 pages, and then come back. Okay, so hopefully you've paused this video, you've gone and found your book, and you've read those 10 pages. Um, so now we can come back and talk about species. So if we were in class, uh, this is a question I would have asked you. Are lions, are Panthera leo and Panthera tigris, those are the species names, um, are they different species? Well, clearly they have two different names, so that's evidence for them, yes, being two different species. Um, but let's, let's think about that as we visit these different species concepts. Okay, so thinking about lions and tigers, oh my. So here's where we're going to define speciation. Um, here's one example of how that could work. So over here, we have this population of beetles, one of the most successful animal groups on Earth, by the way. Um, so we've got some variation in color, one big population, um, and over time, they're going to experience some kind of barrier. So this might be a physical barrier like a river, a mountain range, um, some of them might have started a new population like we did with our sticky notes. Uh, but whatever the situation, this, this former big population has now split into two, and there's no um, gene flow back and forth. So these are now separated for a very long period of time. The so long period of time that could be millions of years that they haven't had any contact with each other. So as we're going through this long period of time, um, in the present day, we see now two very distinct groups. So these, um, there's still variation. These have a more darker color. These overall have a more lighter palette. They're so different now that we can call them different species. So some barrier arose. They had no contact with each other. And now they are different species. 
All right, and this is an idea that if, if we were then to take these two, one from here and one from here, and see if they mated, that could no longer interbreed. They're so different that they can't um, mate and have offspring. So that's kind of one option of how species can arise. Another way of thinking about speciation is a splitting event. Okay, so if we go back to that, that previous slide, there's some kind of barrier. And over time, now we have the split. So we had one ancestral population, and it's going two different ways. So another way to draw this is a diagram like a tree. So we've got one big population right here. Something happens, and now one part of that population is, is splitting this way, and one part of that population is splitting this way. So in your papers, in your resources that you've been using for your phylogeny projects, I'm sure you've seen lots and lots of trees. We're going to dig more into how to read those um, so you feel more comfortable with that information. This is fairly starting looking at these. But whenever we see a point in our trees where they're going to go two separate directions, we can call this a speciation event. So again, just like in our slide before, this long process of being separated, we can call this a species event. So I'll get my pen. If we were drawing our tree diagram, here's our ancestral population. Here is our speciation event. And now it's connected to our two populations of beetles. So this is another way of drawing exactly what's happening on this diagram. In this case, it's just oriented in a different direction. So here's our speciation event. In this case, we had some ancestral population of flies, of fruit flies. Um, this, this group split off and diverged into Drosophila obscura, really cool fruit fly. Another part of this ancestral population split off um, this group underwent another speciation event. Um, so this, this group led to Drosophila melanogaster, a really important fruit fly for research, um, and Drosophila dentissima. So whenever we want to see who's related to who, we look at the most common, the most recent common speciation event, and everything after the split is, is one group. Okay, so we have this species, Dentissima, most closely related to Melanogaster, and these both together have a common ancestor with this fruit fly over here. So speciation, we can define it as a splitting event that creates two or more species from a single ancestral species. Um, so there's different ways of how that happens. We're going to talk about them later. Um, but one part is genetic isolation and then genetic divergence, so changing over time. Okay, so, so the ultimate question then, well, what is a species? We asked about lions and tigers. Here we're looking again at this wonderful assortment of beetles, all kinds of different shapes and sizes and colors, different habitats, different behaviors. Um, there's different ways of defining what a species is. If we're looking at the biological species concept, that was one of our three, the biological species concept says that one species is a group of organisms that interbreed but are reproductively isolated from other groups. So this cool beetle with the big um, horn-like structures right here can interbreed with other beetles that look just like it and cannot breed with something that looks like this. That would make this a species according to the biological species concept. Okay, so if we're using the biological species concept for lions and tigers, you probably already have an idea um, if they are one or two species. So do you think they interbreed? Can you take a lion and a tiger and have them make offspring? Uh, well, actually, 
you can. Um, so you may have seen pictures um, of these cats. You can mate a lion and a tiger, and it makes a liger, so a hybrid between tigers and lions. But you're not going to see these just wandering around the world. So the, the places you see ligers, or these offspring between lions and tigers, um, are in animal parks um, or other places that um, keep these animals in captivity. So in captivity, just some kind of um, park or um, some other kind of facility, res uh, reserve, um, sanctuary, those kind of things. All right, so for our biological species concept, kind of iffy on if lions and tigers are different. Um, but the fact that they don't happen in the wild lends more evidence to, yes, they are two species. And then if we look at where lions and tigers live, so African lions have this specific range in Africa, um, nowhere else wild in the world in this day and age. Tigers are only found um, in different regions of Asia. And so in the wild, they are never going to encounter each other. Right, so even though they can interbreed um, if they're brought together in the wild, they would never make contact. So we can count them as a separate species. But if we were sticklers about what the biological species concept means, these would actually be lumped together into one big group. Okay, so we're starting to see why there might be different ideas of what a species means, right? Clearly these two animals are very different different behaviors, this one's much larger, different ways of interacting, these live in big groups, these do not, all kinds of things separate these two cats. Um, so that leads to some of the disadvantages of using this idea as our only idea for describing species. Um, so some distinct organisms can still interbreed, just like lions and tigers, there are other examples and they're separated by, by millions of years of evolution and somehow are still able to come together. Um, another reason why this isn't the most helpful idea is that we can't use these for extinct organisms, right? So we can't use the biological species concept to tell different dinosaurs apart because we can't breed them. Um, so, so not helpful for paleontologists. Um, we also can't use this criteria for asexual organisms. We talked a little bit about asexual organisms way back when we were looking at that Carl Zimmer article. Um, but things like yeast and those big poplar trees um, can just make new organisms with, without sexual reproduction. So this idea that two things can mate and that's one species doesn't really apply to asexual organisms. Okay, so we, ha we have one idea um, but it's not uh, all-encompassing. So that's why we have a couple different definitions of what a species is. So we'll look at two other definitions of species. So the, the second one is a morphospecies concept. Morph just means form or shape. So this is going to determine species based on what they look like. And then a phylogenetic species concept um, is going to use evolutionary history to decide who's a species. So coming back to this question, using the morphospecies concept, one species is a group of organisms that are morphologically or structurally distinct. So we can look at this panel of butterflies, we can look at their colors, their wing shape, um, other characteristics about them, we can use what they look like to tease them apart. So this one's got blue coloration, um, kind of an offshoot shape right here, whereas there's more of a smooth edge, we can call these different species. That's kind of the idea for a morphospecies concept. So when we think about lions and tigers, this one has this glorious mane, right? These ones have these beautiful stripes, these are more orange and white. 
the yellow and brown, so lots of physical characteristics that separate these. So according to a morphospecies concept, lions and tigers are two very different species. Uh, but just like the biological species concept, the morphospecies concept has some drawbacks. Um, some species are polymorphic. So poly, again, means many. Morph means shape. So one individual species can have multiple different phenotypes. Um, so if you're looking in your guidebook and you see a frog that's this bright orange, and next to it you see this frog that's red and has uh, black spots, if you're using a morphospecies concept, you would be very comfortable in saying those are two completely different species. However, um, when we look at a couple different factors, these are all one species. So they're called neotropical strawberry frogs, um, probably because scientists found things that look like this, called them one species. Um, but when we look at other sources of data, actually all of these different colors are just one. So we can be severely misled um, to thinking polymorphic species are many species when in fact they're all the same thing. Another drawback of the morphospecies concept is this idea of mimicry. Um, so there's lots of different examples of mimicry in nature. One really cool case is this viceroy butterfly um, doesn't have any kind of toxic compounds. Um, it's very bright and colorful, so animals can see it. But it doesn't get eaten as often as you would expect because it looks just like this monarch butterfly. And monarchs eat milkweed plants, so they're able to build up these toxic compounds. So things that would want to eat this monarch butterfly and take a bite will get really sick. And so if we were using our morphospecies concept to look at these two butterflies, we would say, oh, wow, they have these white dots along the side, this beautiful orange color on their wings. Those look just the same. Um, but these are two completely different species. This one's just taking advantage of the fact that it can look similar to the poisonous one, um, but it doesn't have to have those toxic compounds. Eat completely different plants. Still less likely to be eaten by predators because it looks like something that tastes disgusting. So mimicry kind of fools our, our ability to tell species apart if we're only looking at their physical characteristics. Um, another issue with the morphospecies concept is if you're thinking about scientists and kind of the differences in people, one person might think, um, you know, the length of their antenna is really important. Another person might think the different range of colors in their wings is really important. So there might be differences in what scientists measure and how much weight they put into each of those ideas. So the morphospecies concept, um, they're a little bit hard to, to test and tell apart, and they can fall prey to mimicry and polymorphism. So our last definition of what a species is, uh, is our phylogenetic species concept. So we've been looking at phylogenies quite a bit. A phylogenetic species is one that's uh, decided based on evolutionary history. So a good species under this concept is the smallest group, the smallest monophyletic group on the tree. So what monophyletic means, mono is one, phyle is, is tribe or group. So each one of these um, pieces right here, each one of these nodes or spots where things branch off is a speciation event. And so we can look at each one of these and draw a circle, which we've already done. So this group A, B, C are monophyletic. It has one common ancestor between the three of them. A and B are also monophyletic. I'll get a different color. So the second speciation event here, A and B have the most recent common ancestor together. So this is also a monophyletic group. Um, 
Okay, so monophyletic groups um, are an ancestral group and all of its descendants. So A and B are monophyletic because we can trace them back to this node right here. A, B, and C are monophyletic because we can trace it back to this speciation event. Um, so good species then are, are the smallest monophyletic groups. So A is a species, B is a species. They're each these individual leaves or branches on the, on the tree of life. Okay, well, it's one thing to say that it's due to evolutionary history, um, but how do we figure out how they're related on this tree? So if we took that big panel of butterflies, how would we know which species was A, which was B, how they're related? Um, so this is just a one slide version of what could be multiple classes on this idea. But the way we determine evolutionary history uh, right, so evolution is the change in allele frequencies over time. When we're looking at organisms over long and long periods of time, lots of changes have occurred. So we can look at the differences in the genes of organisms and use those differences to organize them on our tree of life. So if we're looking at our orangutan, uh, this is a genetic sequence. So the blue bars are pieces that are in common uh, among these four. When we're looking at the gray areas, those are pieces that are not in common. So when we look at the orangutan genetic information compared to the rest, it's much more different than these three. Right? So our orangutan's genetic information is different from the rest, so we can draw them as a separate group from this speciation event right here. Okay, so then this population kept chugging along. Another speciation event happened here, and we know gorillas are next on this branch because as we're looking through, we have a change here that's not in common with orangutans. Um, so th these regions are very different. This region's different. And when we're looking at these other two, it does not share this gap right here. It doesn't share this gap right here. Um, so there's enough differences between gorillas and chimps and humans that we can place it next on this branch. So the two most similar with this data set are humans and chimps. And as we look along at the differences, we notice that chimpanzees have, have this gap that we don't have. Um, so there are some differences between our information. So we, we place these two on different branches. So again, these nodes are speciation events. And these are individual species because they've followed these divergences. So evolutionary history shows us um, who is a good species. So don't worry about all the, the numbers and the colors on this diagram, but just thinking about that tiger and lion question again, right? Thinking about if there are two species. But the biological species concept, we kind of got an iffy answer, right? We can still mate them. Um, but because they're so far apart, that wouldn't really happen. With our morphological species concept or a morpho species concept, uh, we said yes, definitely, they are very different species. Um, but we can also use the phylogenetic species concept to look at these cats. So we can look here at the different images of our cats. So some scientists got some genetic information from these six cat individuals. And we can trace their evolutionary history on this diagram. So we've got lions up here and tigers all the way down here. So lions and tigers are very separate in their evolutionary history. Right? We have to go all the way back to this dot, this node, this speciation event. Um, 
to find the most recent common ancestor between tigers and lions. So using our phylogenetic species concept, we can definitively say that lions and tigers are very different. Um, if you notice these colored bars, instead of just saying who's related to who, we can also draw traits on this tree to show um, what changes have occurred that led to these different species. So in this case, tigers have this green, orange, red trait that separate it um, from things that are, that are related to it. Okay, so just this idea that we can, that we can use genetic information to see who's related to who, um, and that we can use that framework to describe different species. Um, we talked about disadvantages of the other two, so a couple disadvantages of the phylogenetic species concept um, in terms of studying organisms. Um, this is a very useful definition, so we can test it, um, we can add lots of information to it. However, the data needed to make those phylogenetic trees can be really expensive and hard to get. So if you think about how to get DNA from a lion, not the easiest task in the world. Different types of data, different analyses may lead to different hypotheses of how things are related. So sometimes we have a really clear idea of who's who. Sometimes uh, different data sets give us, give us different answers. So you might have seen in your research that some people have um, one way of, of placing their organisms and other researchers have a different answer. But when we're thinking about species, Biogenetic species concept is, is really nice. Again, very robust, good and testable, um, but can be hard to figure out. So we've talked about different um, ideas about what species are. But we know that there are different species. So how does that arise? How does that come about? Um, overall, there's some interruption in gene flow. So somehow, some way, two populations are no longer able to interact, to contribute offspring, to contribute their alleles to the next generation. So that can happen in, in a, a few different ways. So we're going to go through each one individually. So habitat isolation is just what it sounds like. We have two populations. They're separated by some kind of barrier. They don't interbreed because they live in different habitats or they breed in different habitats. So we've got these two mouse species. Here's our forest mouse and our beach mouse. They look very similar. However, these only reproduce in the forest and these are exclusively beach dwellers. So when they're looking for mates, these are only gonna look on the beach these are only going to look in the forest. Therefore, they're never going to interact. They're never going to interbreed. So that's how habitat isolation can lead to different species. So if we had some ancestral population, one preferred to be kind of in that dark foresty area, one loved the sun and wanted to stay over there, over time, those preferences would be maintained and they would become different species. So that's habitat isolation. Temporal isolation just means isolation in time. So looking at these two toad species, um, or, or bullfrogs, excuse me, Bufo americanus, American toad, and our fowler's toad, don't breed in the wild, even though they may look very similar, because their breeding season is really early, and their breeding season is really late. So if they're searching for mates in late May and early June, and then they stop breeding and go about their business. Meanwhile, the fowler's toads show up in late July, early August, wanting to party. These two toads are not going to interact. So they're separated by time. Temporal isolation. Sometimes it's not um, place or time, but it's how they act. So some have different courtship displays. Um, so if you haven't seen fireflies out in the summer, it's, it's a really beautiful display 
males and females signal to each other with their bright glowing abdomen. The females tend to hang out on leaves, waiting for a signal from a male who's flying around. There's different species of fireflies that have different patterns of their glow. So some will kind of do little spurts. Some will have longer flashes with bigger pauses. So if you're a species that has those spurts of activity, you're not going to recognize that signal if you're looking for something that has that longer period in between. So different species um, use unique patterns of flashes. So the behavior can drive those differences. OK, so we've talked about uh, space, time, behavior. Um, now we can also think of gametic isolation. So even if you are in the same place, even if you are mating at the same time, um, even if you do the same thing, sometimes you still can't interbreed because your gametes are not compatible. So if for other reasons your populations have been separate for a long time and then they come back together, the differences may be too large to interact. So this red sea urchin and this purple sea urchin live in the same place, mate at the same time, but they have different proteins that determine whether the sperm can penetrate the egg. So some change happened. Those allele frequencies changed. They have different proteins. So they, their gametes physically cannot meet to make that next generation. There's also mechanical isolation. Um, so if you think about a tiny little chihuahua and a huge Great Dane uh, left to their own devices, probably can't interbreed. Their reproductive structures are not compatible. Um, so very, very large breeds and very small breeds are unable to mate and have offspring just because of that large size difference. Um, however, sometimes you can get mixes of these two dogs. If a Chihuahua mated with a little bit larger dog and a Great Dane mated with a little bit smaller dog, sometimes you can get that um, genetic mixing with those intermediate sizes. However, if we took those two extremes and tried to put them together, it wouldn't work. So sometimes, um, you might be able to see kind of that, that general progression from a medium size to one or the other. And over time, if those sizes get too, too distinct, you can't come back together. So mechanical isolation is another idea. Our last way of how species can occur, we can see post-zygotic isolation. So even if two species or two populations, two organisms, can breed at the same time, same behavior, same place, even if they do mate, sometimes those offspring aren't able to mate anymore. So if you've seen mules, mules are a really cool hybrid between donkeys and horses. So two distinct species based on a couple of our, our concepts. They can mate and produce mule. However, if this mule tried to mate with another mule, they would not be able to have offspring. So any, any offspring that these mule created would be sterile. They're not able to reproduce. So it has to do with how their chromosomes align, um, and that's post-zygotic. So they're able, these donkeys and these horses can make zygotes, they can make offspring, but these offspring can't reproduce. So that's how they're able to maintain these, these separate species. They, t they can technically interbreed, um, but these aren't going to make their own population in the wild. I have a feeling that's a uh, similar case of ligers. I don't know how fertile ligers are. 
So in summary, uh, there's millions of species on Earth. We're still trying to figure out how many there are. Um, the, the amount of diversity is just amazing. You guys are seeing that with your, phylo or with your phylogeny projects. Scientists and people have different definitions of what a species is. Um, each of them has pros and cons. So often we're using different ideas together to figure out um, what organisms look like and how distinct they are. And species arise in different ways. So that um, lack of mixing of alleles can be due to a number of different factors. So there's also a quiz associated with this lecture. Look for that on Moodle. If it's not posted yet, it will be soon. Um, and that's speciation. That's the second lecture for this week. Um, so that's all the information you have for week 11. Um, now we're at that like bigger scale looking at biodiversity. Week 12, next week we're going to start to discuss phylogenies in the fossil records, so kind of rounding out um, our, our talk about evolution should give you the rest of the tools you need to work on your phylogeny projects. And then after that, we'll look at the biodiversity of these different groups. So we're getting to that kind of